welcome back to the Heart Feelings Podcast. This is, of course, my mental health podcast where we talk about stuff like anxiety and depression, aka hard feelings. Thanks for joining me for another week. Last week's episode was a really fun one. We talked about perfectionism and how closely related it is with both people pleasing and anxiety. And I just, I felt really good about that one. You know, I definitely rambled a lot, but what can I say? As a recovering perfectionist myself, I have a lot to say about the matter. So if that's interesting to you, listen to it after this episode. And then what else do I normally say in the beginning of the episodes? Oh, and if you see my makeup right now, if you're watching the visual podcast on YouTube, hi, I'm waving to you. Um, check out the description box. I'll put up the details for this gorgeous pastel graphic liner look that I've got going on. And if you're not seeing me and your interest is piqued by hearing about pastel eyeliners, then definitely subscribe on YouTube and follow me on Instagram for more bold makeup up and mental health content. But okay, moving on to today's topic, which is social anxiety. Yet another mental health topic that is very near and dear to my heart because I'm riddled with it. Social anxiety is one of the stronger subsects, sub subheadings of my anxiety. I just, I lose all of my words when I think about having to socialize, especially with people I don't know. And this topic is really prevalent to me this week because you'll be hearing this on Friday or anytime after Friday you're listening to it, but on Wednesday of this week, I got invited to a networking event, I guess you can call it. It was um, a, a skincare launch that I got invited to, which is more like a networking event. But yeah, I was absolutely terrified to go because I did not know a single other person who was gonna be there. I knew there would be a lot of people. It was in downtown New York City, you know, kind of in a fancy area and it was a fancy brand and I literally could not do anything else on Wednesday, like the entire day and the days leading up to it too. I was just dreading going to this event, not because I didn't think there would be nice people there, or not because I didn't think it was gonna be a fun event, but the idea of socializing with anyone really in general, but especially with people I don't know, just sends me into such a spiral. Honestly, thank God I have therapy on Wednesdays and I spent my entire session talking about how anxious I was about going to that event. But I wanna share some helpful tips that my therapist gave to me and spoiler, I went to the event and everything was fine and I didn't have a panic attack. I, I was still anxious when I was there, but it went a lot better than all of the worst case scenarios that I went through in my brain. So I wanna tell you what I did for some coping mechanisms how I am trying to work on my social anxiety as a 28 year old adult who is trying to make more adult friends. So yeah, if that's interesting to you, then keep on listening because we're talking about social anxiety this week. I think a lot of people refer to themselves as antisocial. It's kind of one of those terms that, you know, has lost its meaning over time and a lot of people use it who maybe don't actually mean it or maybe they just really mean that they value their alone time and they don't like going going out with big groups of people. But there's a big difference between that and having social anxiety. And the differentiator I would say here is when I think about going out to socialize with a large group of people, especially strangers, my entire body tenses up, my heart starts racing, my palms start sweating, and my brain immediately tries to give me 10 reasons why I can't go or why I should make up an excuse to not go because it feels dangerous. And that's the thing that can be so frustrating about anxiety is that it makes you feel like you are in imminent danger of doing this activity when you know logically that there is no danger. Like this networking event I went to yesterday, I knew no one was gonna try to kill me when I was there. I knew I was in no actual danger, but my body before I left was reacting as if I was walking into a war zone or as if I was walking into the, the Sahara Desert with animals. I don't know. I'm trying to give multiple analogies here. A war zone is a fine enough analogy, but it's, it's, that's what's so frustrating about anxiety is it's like there's a disconnect between your brain and your body. Your brain is telling you, I know this feels scary, but it's actually fine. You're not in danger, but your body is telling you, yes, you are really in danger. And that all goes back to at least what I have heard, the information, of all of the information I have absorbed about social anxiety over the years, one of the ones that stuck with me the most is the analogy that like the reason 
we get such anxiety about fitting in with the social crowd is because way, way back in the day, you know, back, back our way back ancestors, early caveman days, if you were rejected from the group, it literally meant death. If you got rejected from your tribe or the, the village that you lived in, it literally meant death because everybody worked together, you know? There were hunters, gatherers, people who built the structures that they lived in, people who hunted and gathered. I can't think of any more examples, but you know, like the villages work together. Every individual person had a part in their survival. So if you were shunned from the group, then it literally meant death. And that still sticks with us. Even though we don't experience that as like modern 21st century people, you know, we can live on our own. We can live an independent life and still survive, we still have that same sensation where being rejected from the group feels like it could lead to death. And hey, hearing that didn't necessarily make my social anxiety go away at all, but at least as somebody who likes to think very logically, that at least makes me feel a little validated, feel a little better to know that like, okay, this is literally psychological. This is something that has been passed down generation to generation and will always probably be a feeling that we get, that we want to fit in with the group. That is a natural feeling to have. And when I was talking to my therapist yesterday about why I get so anxious going into situations where there's gonna be a big group of people that I don't know, I explained to her that it's because I don't know how to start a conversation with people who are already in a group. I feel more comfortable when I see somebody standing alone, like being able to go up to them. If I see someone who also looks socially awkward or socially anxious, I'm like a magnet. I'm like, yep, I see you. We can help each other and be together. But if I walk into a big group where everybody already appears to be friends, I just don't know how to break into that group. For some people, I think, it, I think it's really easy to just you know, start a conversation and insert themselves. It's a very extroverted thing to do. I am not an extrovert, I'm an introvert to my core. So the idea of having to cut in to a conversation that's already happening, no. My anxious brain is like, absolutely not. That is not an option for you, ma'am. But like I said, the event ended up going fine. I did not overcome that fear of interrupting a group of people that were already talking to each other. I only really talked to people who were standing alone and I still had a good time. And I think like taking that off the table for yourself is a perfectly okay thing to do. That's something my therapist really comforted me with yesterday of saying like, there's no expectations. Like the word networking as socially anxious people can send us into shutdown because we hear the word networking, we immediately, at least I immediately, have this visualization of a, a prominent businessman walking into a board meeting where he's schmoozing and talking with everyone and you know, there's cigars being smoked and it's the 1950s madman. Like, I just, that's just the whole visual that I get when I hear the word networking and that makes me want to unzip my skin suit and fully step out of it because that just sounds like my worst nightmare. And so my therapist said to me like, okay, take the word networking off the table. Your goal is no longer to network when you go to this event. Your only goal is to be go there and to be curious about it and to just kind of treat it like an experiment where you're curious and you're checking things out. And if you happen to have an authentic connection with someone, great, but you don't have to force it, you know? And so that really took a lot of the pressure off for me. Um, and I feel like that can be applied to a lot of various social situations where instead of feeling like you have to put on this performance and feeling like you have to be on, you know? I think as anxious people, a lot of us can relate to feeling like we have to turn an on switch when we're in a crowd and like basically pretend that we're not socially anxious, but just giving yourself the permission to not have to be on and to not have to accomplish anything and to just go be present and be curious, it, it helped a lot for me. And I used a similar method a couple months ago where I had to go to another social event where I didn't know anyone, where I literally have this written on a sticky note on my mirror behind me here. And it says on this sticky note, what if instead of fearing the unknown, I was curious about it? Because that's one of the biggest things that my mental health issues, I guess, struggles all boil down to is I am absolutely terrified of the unknown. And I think that weaves in so much with social anxiety, right? Because even if it's not a group of people that are strangers to you, 
We don't know what's going on inside other people's heads. We don't know their personal business, what's going on in their personal lives. So we can't possibly predict the outcome of what's going to happen when we're in any given group of people. I think it's totally different when you're one-on-one -on -one with someone. It's a little easier to read someone. Obviously, if you're only talking to each other, it's easier to figure out what's going on in each other's lives and how you should interact and like how you should behave and everything. But when you're with a large group, there's just no way you can possibly perceive everybody's emotions. So trying to not necessarily replace the fear, because I think that puts too much pressure on us to be like, replace the fear with curiosity, bring in the curiosity too. It's okay if you're still feeling a little scared, but just introduce that curious feeling too. So don't force yourself to cosplay as a non-socially anxious person. Still be your socially anxious self, but just trickle in a little curiosity and think of it more from a curious perspective. I think a lot of us with anxiety can uh, relate to the feeling of being very curious. You know, sometimes that shoots us in the foot when we're out here Googling our symptoms of something at three in the morning and deciding to self-diagnose ourselves with cancer. You know, that sort of curiosity doesn't always help us, but anxious people just too tend to be a little more naturally curious about the world and we want answers to things, right? Because this all ties back to the fear of the unknown. So I think that's a great baby step for us all to take, right? Just instead of going, taking the step from social anxiety to socially confident, the in-between step is curiosity. And my mental health coping mechanism I want to give you this week is going to relate directly to social anxiety and I want to tell you what I did to cope with my social anxiety yesterday, which is, like I just mentioned, having the curiosity. But another thing my therapist told me, this should honestly just be her podcast. I'm always quoting her. She's, shout out to my therapist. I love her. But something that really helped me cope with this event yesterday was she asked me to tell her my plan for after the social event. She was like, tell me what you're gonna do afterwards. Are you gonna come home? Are you gonna go out somewhere else? And so I sat there and I was like, okay, well, I'm gonna have my boyfriend meet me there afterwards, which, great tip. If you're going somewhere where you don't know anyone and you can't bring a friend with you, see if you can have a friend meet you afterwards. You know, if that's in the cards, I understand it's not always, but I said, okay, my plan is my boyfriend's gonna meet me there afterwards, and then we're gonna come home, and we're going to get dinner, and then we're gonna play with my cat all night, because I am a cat lady. I'm obsessed with my cat, Bert. He is the absolute light of my life. He is my son. This is Bert. He is the absolute love of my life. He's a perfect little man, and oh, he's purring. I swear the frequency of his purring is more healing than any antidepressant. Don't quote me on that. I don't actually mean that, but I do a little bit. Now you gotta come over to the visual podcast if you wanna see the boy, he's so sweet. But just like going through and dictating that plan out loud of what I was gonna do afterwards gave me some comfort to know that on the other side of this unknown event, there was something very known, you know? And I think as anxious people, we like to know the plan. We're planners. Don't change plans at the last minute on us. Don't suddenly change the location of where we're getting dinner. Do not change plans on me. So having a plan that was solid after my plan, the event I went to that was not solid, that was unknown in my mind, gave me some sort of comfort. So I'm definitely gonna be using this coping skill going forward in the future because if I ever had a moment when I was at the event where I started to get a little anxious and feel like, oh man, I haven't talked to enough people, I don't know what I'm supposed to do here, I just kept reminding myself like, end of the night, I'm playing with Bert and it's gonna be a lovely time and I have that to look forward to. I do have solid plans in the evening. I am not just out here floating in the ether. I have a journey, I have a direction I'm going on tonight and this is just part of it. All right, and now for my favorite segment which is the mental health song of the week. I swear one of these days I'm gonna come on here and not name a Lucy Dacus song, but just give me this one more, okay? I'm in my Lucy Dacus era right now. If you don't know, Lucy Dacus is a singer-songwriter and excellent guitar player and she's also in Boy Genius with Phoebe Bridgers and Julian Baker. But yeah, I've been listening to her entire discography for like the last few months and I can't get enough of it. And especially her 2016 album, No Burden, 
is chef's kits. Every song a banger. But today I want to talk to you about the song Trust, which is this really beautiful song and one of my favorite lyrics in the song is, if beauty is the only way to make the nightmares go away, I'll plant a garden in your brain and let the roots absorb the pain. I think that is such a beautiful <laughs> visual. It makes me want to get a tattoo of something like that, right? Can you imagine like somebody's little little outline of a brain with like flowers growing out of it? I just think that's really beautiful and I think as people who have mental health struggles, mental mental illness, if you will, that's I, I did a little hang loose for those of you who aren't watching. For those of us with mental illness, I think we can all relate to feeling like we just wish there was something we could plant in our brain to take it all away, and we can't. And that's okay, you know? I think that's something I really had to come to terms with for a while, is knowing that I'm never going to get over my anxiety. Anxiety is not something that that just goes away. It's a literal chemical imbalance in your brain. You know, it's one thing to be anxious about a situation and it's another thing to have anxiety weaving its way through your every thought and everyday life. And the idea of just like planting a garden in your brain and letting the roots absorb the pain just like makes me really happy to think about. And although anxiety, I didn't mean to be a downer there, although our anxiety is never something that's just going to magically go away, there are little flowers we can plant in our brain to help us. And that's the coping mechanisms. That's the mindfulness, the reminding ourselves that with fear also can come curiosity. With the fear of the unknown can come curiosity about the unknown. Those are the little flowers, the little mindful bits and pieces that we can sprinkle into our brain to grow the flowers and to just make us feel more whole inside. So definitely listen to Trust by Lucy Dacus. I wanna compile a playlist of all of the mental health related songs that I have made and I swear I will introduce some new artists. Please let me know, if you're watching on YouTube, leave me a comment, let me know who I should listen to that you feel like sing some good mental health songs. You know I love music about mental health. It's my favorite type of music to listen to. Um, and if you're not watching on YouTube, head over to YouTube. I wish Spotify or Apple Music let you leave comments. But yeah, this is the end of the episode, a really natural segue to the conclusion. Um, but yeah, I thank you so much for listening to yet another episode of the Hard Feelings, a mental health podcast. I had such a good time chatting with you about social anxiety today. And definitely, if you are listening, on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, rate and review this episode. I would love to hear from you. If you're on YouTube, subscribe, check out the description box for all the details of the makeup on my face today. Follow me on Instagram for more bold makeup and mental health related content. And I thank you so much for listening and I'll talk to you with a new episode next Friday. Bye. Take care of yourself.